So hey everyone, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm a JavaScript engineer at Wayfair. And one of the things I love about JavaScript is that you can do anything. Um, it's an incredibly dynamic and incredibly fluid language. Uh, you can do quite a bit, but unfortunately that also means that it's very, very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. And you can do kind of silly things like this. Like you can go ahead and take a variable and just change its value into all sorts of different kind of types. So we can start with x and we, we can start x out and it's type of undefined, which makes sense. And, and we can throw a number into it and change it to a string and change it to a boolean and change it to an object and change it back to anything we like. We could change it to null and that would be type of object because that makes sense. So there are a whole bunch of, uh, of things we can do and this can be very, make it very difficult to reason about your code. And as your code base becomes larger and larger and your modules become more complex, this can become incredibly challenging. Uh, we have these types in JavaScript, but we, we don't know what they are. Um, we don't know what our type is when we compile our code and we can't be explicit about what we want them to be. So we have seven types in JavaScript. These probably look familiar. Um, Boolean number string object, null and undefined, we have symbols in ES6. Uh, and that's, that's great. Uh, and we write our code with these expectations. So we can swap types between things. We can have variables be very dynamic in terms of their type. And that's great, except for the fact that when we write a function, we frequently expect that it's going to operate in a certain way. Um, so this is a function I'll refer to, just like a really basic example that I refer to several times in this talk, and it's basically a summing function. So it takes an array of numbers, it starts the sum at zero, it iterates through that array, adds them to the sum, and returns it. And so if I add two and three here, that makes a lot of sense. I get five, and that works. But if I add two strings, I get this like zero foo bar, which isn't really expected. Um, but that's not clear from, from just looking at, uh, at the code. And then if I go ahead and throw null into there, I get an exception. Um, that certainly wasn't expected. And so there's all sorts of behavior that we build into our functions, uh, even a simple one like this, that we don't have a way to enforce. So what do we do? How can we, how can we approach this? Um, how can we solve it when it's making it challenging to write our code? So I think you might say, well, the easy solution is I'll just, I'll just check what the user uh, or what the developer uh, passed into the array or passed into the uh, function. So I can just check, is the, uh, is the argument ARR? Is that an array? If not, return. If the numbers that I iterate through aren't actually numbers, why don't I return as well? Or maybe I could go ahead and throw exceptions if this is bad enough. And these work. These sort of runtime checks can work. Um, but I think you can imagine this becoming very complex very quickly, uh, especially in a, in a function that has more nuanced type, uh, type expect expectations. And so this, this can become very difficult. And you're also going to miss things. And in addition to that, it's also going to be slow. Like you're also doing all these checks that are completely unnecessary if you wrote your function in a way that was more predictable from the start. So what might be the next possibility? Well, maybe you put comments into your code. How many use JS doc? Okay, so we've got like maybe half of the half of the engineers here. So JS doc is a very common approach to comment your code in a way that's not only human readable but machine readable. Like we can look at this. Uh, some of our IDEs are smart enough to figure this out, and we know here that I want my param to be an array of numbers, and I want it to return a number, and that's nice. I can I can read it, um, and maybe I can even you know get some hints in my IDE when I'm using it. Um, but there's nothing enforced. We're explicit here about types. Uh, we're explicit about what we want our function to do, uh, but we don't do any checking. And code reviews are not type checks. Um, I, code reviews are a great opportunity for that constructive feedback that we heard about earlier today. But when you have to go through a code review and just point out what should be an obvious case of misusing a function, that's not really helping anyone. Um, it's just wasting a lot of time that's really not necessary. So we have type checking in JavaScript. Um, and this is exciting. And I, I think it's exciting for a few different reasons. We've actually had this for a long time. How many of you guys wrote ActionScript? All right, back in the day. So one of the interesting things about ActionScript being a dialect of JavaScript is that we actually had static types built into it. Uh, ECMAScript for had types uh, as part of the, the spec. And 
ECMAScript 4 never really got off the ground, at least in terms of JavaScript. We never really adopted it. And it, there are reasons for that. Um, but ActionScript did conform partially to it. And so we ended up with, with some of this ability to do static typing when we were writing our ActionScript. Uh, let's fast forward a bit. Uh, Google released the Clojure compiler for minifying code. Have you guys used Clojure compiler before? A few people? All right. Um, Clojure compile is cool because it uses this JS doc notation that we mentioned earlier. And so you don't really need to, to change much if you're already doing this. And Clojure compiler minifies code, does some really smart optimizations, doesn't just remove comments, kind of goes even beyond that in terms of um, optimizing JavaScript. But it also does type checks. And so you get some level of type checking when you run it through the Clojure compiler. Clojure compiler runs in Java. Uh, maybe that was one of the reasons it never really took off. Uh, it's a little more difficult to add to your stack. But it was there, and it was one of the kind of forerunners of type checking in JavaScript. And a couple years later, we got TypeScript. And this was kind of a game changer, I think. I think TypeScript really uh, emphasized the fact that types were something that developers wanted, and they were something that was useful. And TypeCheck implemented static typing in a way that was uh, incredibly helpful and incredibly easy to use. And so this is the notation that, uh, that we see for using types, and it's similar to um, action script, slightly different. Uh, and you can go ahead and every point at which you have data in your application, whether that be a variable or an argument or the return value for a function or an object, you can specify what that type should be. And so we get optional type, uh, optional static typing. And by optional, uh, it's often referred to as gradual. So that means that you don't need to type everything. You don't need to go in and say every variable needs a type. Uh, you only type what's, what's useful. Um, you can add types to an existing code base, et cetera. Uh, last year, we got Flow. Uh, Flow came out of uh, Facebook, and it sort of came along with their React project. Uh, not tightly coupled to React, but uh, it was a way to do type checking that was very, very similar to TypeScript. You'll notice that these type annotations are exactly the same as what we saw earlier with TypeScript. Uh, so that was great. The syntax was pretty similar. Uh, but Flow brought some other things to the table. Uh, it brought some more robust null checking. Uh, and it also didn't have as many of the kind of extra features that we saw with TypeScript. Um, and so Flow was a way that we could add static typing on top of existing code. And this year, Flow released uh, a really cool new feature called Flow Comments. And it was this ability to be able to take those same types and do them in comments. And this looks really ugly. Um, this isn't fun to write. But it's JavaScript. Like, this function is 100% JavaScript. We just happen to have some inline comments. So unlike, unlike Flow or TypeScript out of the box, which wouldn't normally run as JavaScript, uh, Flow comments uh, will. So that's, that can be really useful. So taking them all together, um, we kind of see a progression of types being added to JavaScript. And I think this reflects the usefulness that developers have found with them and kind of a, a tendency towards convergence. Um, these run in different environments. So Flow is, runs in OCaml, uh, which means that it doesn't quite work on Windows. It works on uh, Linux and OS X machines. Uh, TypeScript is Java, so it's a little easier. Or JavaScript, so it's a little easier. Um, we can just install it with NPM. And Clojure Compiler, um, Java. One of the important things I think here is that last column. Um, it's all the same, and I don't really like putting columns into tables when they're all the same. But the important thing here is that all of these uh, typing libraries are moving towards support for ES6 very, very rapidly. And so everything that we see in ES6 is very quickly uh, being incorporated into all these checkers. And that includes things like classes and modules and um, different ways to declare variables. And so that can be valuable. And I think that uh, it means that you don't need to choose between ES6 and, and a type checker. So how does this actually work? Um, let's look under the hood and see what this process would look like. I think there are three steps uh, you would need to take if you wanted to add type checking to either a new application or a legacy code base. And the first one's choosing a type checker. I think the two kind of major options right now are TypeScript and Flow. Uh, Closure Compiler is certainly an option depending on, on what, your, what your use cases are. However, TypeScript and Flow have been converging around a particular syntax. And that seems to be the direction uh, the community is going in. Some of the things to keep in mind here, um, like I said, TypeScript will run on any OS, which is really cool. Um, Flow uh, 
right now just runs in OS X and Linux. That's changing. Um, there's a lot of work being done there. TypeScript's a little more mature because 2012 and like three years in JavaScript years is like forever. So we have a lot more uh, resources available for implementing uh, TypeScript. Uh, the key piece here, I think, is the community-provided declaration files. So there's a very large uh, community around uh, that have created declarations uh, that can be used for incorporating third-party libraries into your, uh, into your TypeScript application and incorporating typing for those libraries. Um, there's also some additional features in TypeScript, defaults, overloads. Uh, this can be good and this can be bad. Like it's adding more things to JavaScript. So if you look at TypeScript, you might be like, this is a different language. That being said, as we move towards ES6, a lot of it is actually being incorporated into ECMAScript. So it's less and less a new language and more and more just how we're going to be writing JavaScript. Um, and Flow also means, uh, has this kind of added bonus that if you don't have the ability to have a transpile step, you can implement Flow. So that being said, um, with the standard implementations of either of these, you need a transpile step. How many of you are using some sort of transpile step in your JavaScript right now? OK, wow. Uh, that's more than I expected. It's becoming the thing to do. Um, if you're using JavaScript, you're very frequently not writing vanilla JavaScript anymore. You're writing either CoffeeScript, or maybe you're using React and writing JSX, uh, or maybe you're using Babel, um, formerly 6 to 5, and you're writing ES6, and you're transpiling down to ES5. So a transpile step is, is becoming kind of an expected part of a lot of workflows. And it is a necessary part. Um, in TypeScript and Flow out of the box. And so setting up that transpile step uh, is an important piece. That being said, it's not that hard. Uh, setting up Flow requires you to install Flow. Um, if you're installing on OS X, that means you can use Brew. If you're installing from, um, from a Linux box, or if you uh, would just like to go the old-fashioned way, you can curl the uh, tarball and add it to your path, and you're good to go. Uh, you need to add a transformer. So this is the actual transpile step. Uh, with Flow, you don't need to use a particular transformer. There are multiple ones available. Right now, JSX and Babel are the two big ones. Um, JSX might make sense if you're already using React, though Babel has JSX support out of the box as well. Uh, both of these will strip the types from your code. So that's the important part. The transformer will strip those kind of colon string or colon number or whatever the types are. Those things that aren't JavaScript will get removed from your code before it goes into production, which is important for it to uh, work. So Flow has these two steps. Um, first is the actual checking. So you do your check to see if you actually abide by those contracts that you set up, uh, those types that you wrote into your code. And then the second is doing the, the transform, is removing the parts of your code that aren't JavaScript. So this is just a demo of what that might look like. Um, so I have that same function. I run Flow check. I go ahead and throw something in there that's not a number. I run flow check again, and now I get an error. Type is incompatible with number. Change it back to a number, and there we go. It works. And so that's all it is. Um, let's go to TypeScript. TypeScript's very similar. Uh, you don't need two steps, though. TypeScript does both the transforming and the checking together. So go ahead and install TypeScript, with npm install. Um, it prefers to be installed globally. Install TypeScript. And uh, then just run TSC and run the file uh, that you have written in TypeScript. TypeScript expects .ts files out of the box. So uh, it'll actually transpile these by default to JS files. If you wanted a more robust uh, transpile system, there are uh, tools available, Grunt or Gulp or whatever your uh, task runner of choices, that you can implement around this for a larger code base. Uh, same thing with TypeScript here. have that same exact function, same exact types. I put in something that uh, is not a number. I'm going to get uh, argument of type string number. Uh, array of string numbers is not, a, not assignable to parameter of type array of numbers. So those are the sort of messages that you would get as a developer. And that's how you know that you've done something wrong with your types and how you can uh, address it and fix it. So then the actual step is uh, the important one is adding your type annotations. You don't really have much without these. So the good news is you get a whole bunch for, uh, for free. Uh, both TypeScript and Flow have type inferences. So that means when, it, when they look at your code for the first time, even if you haven't added any types at all in there, it's going to infer some types based on things that are pretty obvious. So here we have var x equals 1. I know 1 is a number. x dot length uh, is not a thing because numbers don't have length. 
And so both Flow and TypeScript are going to tell me you can't do that. This is really cool because it means that without doing any work, I get type benefits uh, with either of these just by installing them and running them on my code. Uh, this is pure JavaScript, but it's statically analyzing my code and figuring out some stuff is wrong with my types. The downside here is actually that if you have legacy code bases, you may actually have code like this. Um, and it may be code that's not throwing an error because you haven't tested that code path. Maybe it's behind some obscure code path that you haven't written unit tests for or you haven't tested in production. So you may have immediately um, when running Flow or TypeScript some errors that show up. This is okay. Um, I think it's actually a good thing. I think catching something like this is actually pretty good. Uh, these are sort of the low-hanging fruit errors. Uh, so they're ones that you can address pretty quickly and probably should address pretty quickly. All right, what do these types uh, actually look like as we start adding them uh, to our code? So for Flow and TypeScript, we get a whole bunch of these basic types uh, right away. So these are types that mirror very closely to the primitive values we looked at earlier. Uh, they map pretty closely between Flow and TypeScript. There are some slight differences. Uh, void refers to undefined in both of these. Um, and any is sort of this super type that will allow you to pretty much untype something. So if you want a variable and you want to go ahead and do the switching between string and number and boolean and undefined, you can go ahead and put any there and it will just allow types to flow in and out of that variable. And so the basic syntax is to uh, just do colon and the type after uh, the variable. You can type arrays in the same way. Um, we actually have two options for notation in both Flow and TypeScript. For arrays, you have the number bracket bracket, um, or you can say array sub number, which is uh, a fairly common syntax as well. If you're coming from different uh, other statically typed languages, some of these might look familiar. We also have union types. Union types are the ability to say I want it to be this type or that type. So maybe I do actually want to take advantage of some of uh, JavaScript's dynamic typing. And so I want my variable to be able to be a number or a string. Maybe because it's legacy code and that's how it works. Maybe because I've decided that that's how my function ought to be written. Well, that's fine. I can go ahead and just put a pipe between my uh, type annotation and it will allow either of these types to flow into this data. Uh, one of the ways that Flow has an advantage over TypeScript is its uh, ability and power to do null checking. So Flow will be stricter about null values in your code uh, being misused. So in this case, I set something to be null, and I try to access a property on it. And Flow knows for a fact that you can't do that, because null doesn't have a property called foo. And so Flow will, will throw an error and tell me that. Um, TypeScript won't say anything. Um, it's part of just how the language is built, and there's discussion on uh, regarding changing that. Uh, but right now, that's sort of one of the places where Flow uh, has an advantage. We can type functions, and because functions are first class in JavaScript, um, they're also uh, values themselves. They have values. Uh, we see this in our return values. So if I have a function, I can pass in a string, and it's going to return a string. Uh, and so this means I can actually start to compose things. So if I have add exclamation and I pass in hello world, I know that add exclamation takes a string, and I know that hello world returns a string, and so Flow and TypeScript are going to be completely cool with this. Whereas if hello world returned a number or it returned uh, you know, an object, then it would let me know that that's a problem. And I can do this with objects as well. Uh, this is particularly useful when you're passing like options hashes into functions. So I can expect that uh, I'm going to have this object called model object being passed in uh, as an argument to my function. And I really only care about the title uh, attribute here. I only care about this, this string property on my object. So I only have to type that. I don't have to type ID and flag, which is a boolean there. I can just type title, and my function will work fine, because it will get an object that has something called title that happens to be a string. Uh, and it doesn't have to be this particular object that passed in, it could be another one. And if we sort of take this to the next conclusion, um, I think we get the real power in, in typing, and that's the ability to start to do interfaces. So instead of repeating this over and over again and saying this is the object that is going to be of a certain shape, I can abstract it out, put it in something called an interface. Uh, the type transformer is just going to delete this when it compiles down to JavaScript. But until then, it's going to give some information to the type checker and allow me to start to you know, say there are certain shape objects that I expect to be in my code. 
And we can actually start to use these with external libraries as well. So this is one of the places where TypeScript actually has a big advantage uh, because there are a whole bunch of uh, TypeScript declaration files that are basically collections of interfaces on tops of libraries we, we already use, things like Ember, Angular, Backbone, uh, jQuery, underscore, whatever, whatever it is that we use. Um, there's likely a declaration file out there for it. And if not, you could write one yourself, whether it's for a third-party library or a library that you write internally. Uh, interfaces really give us the ability to define the shape of our object. And there's so much more. Um, I tried to kind of give a brief introduction here of how you would normally use uh, these, these type checks, but there are a whole bunch of features of, of both of these libraries uh, that can be beneficial to a code base as it becomes more complex. All right. <laughs> So you know how to do it. Um, but that seems like a lot of work, right? Like you gotta, you know, figure out what the shape of your data is in each function. And uh, you, if you have to add it to old code, there might be work involved. And this is a fair question to ask. It's not a, a presumed answer here. And I don't know that there's one answer for everyone. I don't, you know, maybe uh, for whatever reason it does, it makes sense not to use static typing for you. But I think there are a few reasons that it is worth it. Um, I think the first one is that you catch more bugs at compile time. And catching more bugs at compile time is awesome because that means you catch less bugs at runtime and less bugs in production. Uh, if we can figure out what's going to be an issue beforehand while we're developing, we can shorten that feedback cycle in terms of detecting bugs in our applications and address them right away. And the developer can address them. And that's great. In this case, flows null checking is telling me that, hey, if I don't pass the string to my function, it's not going to work. And in fact, in this case, I wouldn't even get an exception. Like this might end up in production and I wouldn't know that it wasn't working until my, uh, until my integration test told me that something was wrong or until a customer complained. And by that time, it's too late. It helps you to uh, document your code behavior uh, without having to kind of write the long form documentation. The long form documentation is still helpful, but sometimes this is a, a little bit easier just to get the shape of how your code's starting to work. Um, this is an example from one of the internal underscore functions that's used for underscore.flatten. And if I look at kind of the default JavaScript version, I see there's input, shallow, strict, and, you know, maybe the person who wrote this function, uh, well, in this case, you know, they chose sort of useful terms to name their arguments, but that might not be the case. I've seen functions where you have very arbitrary names that aren't helpful at all. And it would have been helpful if I had known, for example, that input has to be array. Shallow and strict are booleans, which means they're probably flags, and it's going to return an array. And I think the return value here is really important because we can start to see pieces of our code and how they're going to behave at a higher level. And it becomes easier to reason about your code uh, without having to read the internals of each function. You can start to look at functions and modules as, as more black boxes. And so you, when you want to start looking at the architecture of your application, you can see that you have this thing that's going to take in a number and return a string, and like, well, I can compose that with something that takes a string and returns an object, and I can compose that with something else that takes an object. And so you start to uh, think about your code at a higher level, and I think that's very powerful. Uh, it allows us to start thinking of more powerful architectures that we can implement in our application uh, that, that simplify the code. And it means you don't have to look at line by line to figure out how things are working. At the end of the day, this is about correctness. It's about writing code that performs according to their specification. Because it's about giving your code a specification. And that specification isn't some 60-page spec file. It's the specification written into the code itself. And so that's really powerful. If for anything else, tooling is really good for uh, static typing. So these are plugins for, uh, for TypeScript. And they would certainly work with, with Flow. And there are plugins for Flow, I believe, as well. Um, and this is IntelliJ and Sublime, but you could certainly um, add these into, I know there are plugins out there for, for Vim and Emacs and whatnot. So whatever you use, there's likely some sort of plugin there. And, and the reason I point that out is not because you need a plugin, because it helps your engineers write better code. Um, and it helps make it easier to onboard people. And if for no other reason, um, this might actually be in JavaScript one day. Um, you know, this is how things get added to the language. The community starts to pick things up. They become very useful. And both TypeScript and Flow in working towards uh, converging their syntax here, they're also interested in looking towards what this might look like in ECMAScript itself. And so we're not there yet, um, but we potentially could be there uh, one day. Uh, thanks.